Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. Even better, tell your friends about the best wine show anywhere. So if this area kind of looks familiar, except the fact that I got the blinds down this time, I am back in Houston at Hotel Zaza in the Museum District. This time, we're doing some Chianti. Um, I'm with Luca Alves. And we had an amazing masterclass that he led and then a walk around tasting. So we're kind of doing this post, whereas last week's video was pre everything. So um, I'm excited to kind of talk about what we finished doing. And uh, Luca, I want you to kind of say who you are, who you're with and kind of how you got here. Yeah. First of all, thank you. Yes. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for being here and uh, for being part of this event. Uh, for us, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in Houston. It is not our first time. We came last year, uh, so this is our second time, but every time is like the very first time mm -hmm. when, uh, when you come to a new place. Um, my name is Luca, Luca Alves. As you introduced me, I'm the event manager and um, wine ambassador of the Chianti Wine Association, Consorcio Vino Chianti. And um, actually, my, my job, it's, um, it's to spread all over the, the world the, the, the Chianti wine in terms of culture, knowledge behind the bottles. And I would say that most of all, um, my privilege is to have the opportunity to share uh, the wine culture behind the bottle, mm -hmm. which is very important for us, especially in Chianti and in Italy. Uh, for us, wine is not just a liquid, it's more than a liquid, it's uh, more than a food, it's something that we need and we have to share all over the world. So every single occasion that we have all over the world, doesn't matter if it's in North America, South America, Asia, it is um, very, very important for us. Nice. Today's we had, uh, I hope that you like it, we had a nice flight of Chianti Reserva, Yes. Today's uh, subject was the um, Chianti Reserva um, uh, 2019 Vintage. This is my cue to hold of this really cool tasting mat. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty proud of these table mats. I used to do it quite large because I like that people enjoy yeah. with uh, enough space enjoy and uh, with all the details. Mm -hmm. And today we experienced 2019 Vintage throughout uh, uh, seven beautiful examples of Chianti Reserva. Another special thing that we experience is that uh, every single wine uh, was coming from the seventh sub-region of Chianti. So technically speaking, it was like an horizontal tasting, but throughout the entire, entire panorama of what it is Chianti, the OCG appellation nowadays. As you probably know, we still have seven sub region Six of this seven sub region were established in 1932, so almost one century ago. Yes. We are quite proud to, to declare this and to underline this because our diversity in terms of different subregion, different styles, uh, uh, soils, microclimate condition, our, um, actually our uh, heritage. So it is very important to, to show this diversity in the glass, outside the glass, in general, to show this uh, heterogeneous kaleidoscope that is Chianti nowadays. Mm -hmm. Back in the days, probably, this aspect, this side of Chianti was not a point of strength. Most of the producers tend to hide that this is from a smaller sub-region, etc., because maybe sub-region somehow uh, appeared like something that is uh, like a minor, from a minor god. Okay. I believe that is not. It's, it is truly the heritage and what is most interesting in our appellation. So this diversity shows us the beauty of Sangiovese grapes, mm -hmm. uh, the beauty of uh, Sangiovese clones, but most of all, the attitude and the versatility of this wine. Yeah. We have to remember that Chianti is probably the greatest table wine 
so-called table one, but in a good way, I would yes, say. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it means that um, a good glass of Chianti can stand wherever, but on the table with food, it will be always the best place to be with a glass of Chianti wine. So this, uh, how to say, this title of table wine in a good way for me represents a lot of the Chianti essence. Mm -hmm. So to have this... Um, dynamism inside our appellation it is very important yeah so um one of the things that i talk about in my videos when we talk about it, it's the, the the term table wine really is it sounds sounds like it's bad but actually in the eu that yeah. is the technical so you have table wine or dry table wine then you have like sweet and other stuff so it's just a normal term but us we kind of seem to make it seem like it's not that great but i mean telling you yeah. The, the wines, well, the wines that I had in this class and the wines I had in the walk around tasting, they, they're not these like, no, they're, they're yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> not that kind of table. Yeah, they, they were fantastic. Not the common yeah. vino da tavola, like we say right. in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Vino per la tavola. Yeah. Wine to, to, to stand on the table properly. I mean, technically, right. best wine to use on the table. So er, earlier, so in the, in the class, you kind of start off a little bit of history. So um, you talked about how, how winemaking had been happening for quite a while in Italy and specifically in Tuscany. So can you kind of briefly talk about that? Yeah, yeah. The, the roots of Chianti are pretty, uh, are pretty deep. And the viticulture itself is deeply rooted in Tuscany. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to know that Tuscany before being called Tuscany has been called like Etruria. The, it means the land of the Etruscan civilization. Uh, most of the Italian believe and show that uh, viticulture itself and uh, the wine consumption has been created and invented in Italy. That is not 100% true because we had a strong impact and heritage throughout the Greek culture, especially throughout the so-called migra Greek migrants that colonize a lot of uh, places in the Mediterranean Sea peacefully. And uh, they spread a lot of culture and uses, including the custom of the wine. They already were producing wine, um, and they uh, were already into the cult of wine, so-called symposium. So the wine was very important. And yeah. probably most of you don't know that uh, the south of the Italian peninsula has been colonized for the very first time by migrant, Greek migrants, the so-called Magna Grecia. If you haven't been to Campania region, if you haven't been to Naples or to Ischia Highlands, uh, you have to know that Ischia itself, it was the very first colony, very, the very first Greek colony outside Greece. Yes. Uh, Napoli itself now takes the name from the Latin, Neapolis, new town, new city. But back in the days, the original name was Parthenope, like the name of the goddess from, Greeks, from Greece. So this is very important to underline the impact of the Greek uh, culture throughout the south of Italy, of the peninsula, Italian peninsula. The Greeks probably meet uh, uh, Etruscans, and uh, since the Etruscans, they were, they were very um, into um, fine culture, um, and crafts, uh, in general, architecture. So they were um, a quite um, um, fine and elegant uh, civilization, they adopted uh, instantly the use and the production of the wine. Yeah. So we can say that throughout the Etruscan civilization, uh, the roots of um, the viticulture in Tuscany started to be more and more uh, present and important. Cool. So you might have heard him talk about symposium. Um, so in Greek culture, a symposium was a collect people would gather to discuss everything, really. Yeah. Uh, life, politics, and one of the things about the symposium um, was that they drank wine, but they drank watered-down wine. Matter of fact, the Greeks thought it was very uncultured to drink wine at full strength, and the reason for that was because you needed to keep a clear head. However, alcohol kind of loosens the lips a little bit, allows people to be a little more relaxed, but they didn't want you to be drunk where now you say something stupid, yeah. and then you have a fight. So yeah. that's where the symposium So, So with the Etruscans, which... I had to be reminded of this about that they were actually a cultured society. And because I think a lot of times we think that the Romans were the cultured society, and you know, I'm going to get that in a second. Um, 
but the Etruscans also had it. They weren't like barbarians. They were very cultured. Just the Romans just kind of like did what they did. Um, so I can see why they really kind of um, had this uh, symbiotic or not symbiotic, but this this um, uh, they, the love of Greek of the cultures of Greek. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure we, we talked about that as to what the symposium was. Um, but yeah, anyway, yeah. so now, so, so oh, yeah. the Greeks and the Etruscans, yeah. they get together, they have yeah. a great time. Yeah. They, and you mentioned the, the Romans yeah. and right after the, the Etruscan civilization, we had the Romans. Uh, so a lot of people know about Romans uh, more than Etruscan civilization. And you mentioned something interesting about the symposium. Uh, do you know that, for example, and maybe people that are listening to us, uh, they don't know that uh, the very first sommelier were born into the empire, the Roman Empire. It was called Austores. So the very first sommelier, they used to discuss, they used to decant the wine uh, inside the symposium. So this figure of the sommelier, or in general, the position of wine was central in the uh, Roman culture as much as in the Etruscan culture. But one thing for sure changed a lot the face of the viticulture and the consumption of wine, and it was due to the attitude of the Romans. Because since the Etruscans were very into, uh, how to say, uh, philosophy, art, uh, beauty in general, they were a little bit like um, hippie of, this, uh, mm. of that time. <laughs> I like uh, that. Romans yeah. said they were a little bit more into focus on the um, commerce, on selling mm -hmm. the thing, of uh, uh, finances, of capitalizing the effort to produce something. So the wine needed to change its um, attitude into something more commercial, to produce the wine and to spread the wine all over the Mediterranean colonies mm -hmm. of the Roman Empire. So it started to be uh, in different types of wine different types of aging, different varieties of grape um, cultivated. So this important switch, this important turn, happened during the Roman Empire. Uh, after this, we had, of course, uh, one of the most crucial era of the, um, of the viticulture in Tuscany and in general in Europe. There was the Middle Age. The very first part of the Middle Age was not very good very dark, mm -hmm. a lot of diseases, wars, so the, the use and consumption of the wine seemed to be um, uh, destined to, be, uh, to disappear. But one thing, only one thing saved the wine, the fact that the wine itself it was very important and um, crucial for the um, Christianism itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, blood of Christ, the red wine. Right. So the, product, the production of the wine was, like to, I to say, uh, essential, very important. And throughout a category, uh, it is curious to understand that the monks somehow saved the viticulture in Europe, but they silently continued to produce wine inside the monasteries and to develop techniques, to develop, uh, for example, um, crossing different grape varieties, the aging and everything. And another important thing is that the monks were highly um, educated mm -hmm. and they could write also and they could transcribe in books. That was very important because at that time, most of the people didn't know how to write. How to, how to write. Yes. And uh, even about to uh, transcribe in books. And the act itself to publish book was not common. So these uh, factors mm, helped a lot. They, they saved actually the, the viticulture itself and the culture behind the viticulture. And um, arriving at Renaissance, Renaissance probably is the most famous period that we have in our history. Uh, Florence itself it was considered the capital of, the, um, of all. Finances, architecture, mm -hmm. art, literature, everything related to beauty and to, how to say, wealthy uh, status was related to the city of Florence. Uh, there was no place like Florence in, uh, in the entire Europe and, uh, and in the entire uh, known world during the Renaissance. So to be in Florence, to work in Florence, to have connection with Florence was very important and including for the viticulture, wine mating, and the wine commerce itself. The wine was already 
um, completely bonded with the uh, society at that time, uh, from the humble tables of the humble people throughout the um, aristocrat um, aristocracy. It was uh, something that uh, um, could not miss on the table and on the society in general. Uh, during this period, a dynasty, the most important one that we have in our recent history, Medici family dynasty, uh, impact a lot on the viticulture, on the wine culture itself. And they did it throughout a lot of uh, different acts, not just on the production, because they also uh, pr used to produce wine, but also throughout some uh, laws, some um, intervention on, that, um, on the organization of the time. For example, the so-called uh, organization in Arti Minori and Arti Maggiori in, the, in, this, uh, in this manifest, uh, Arte dei Vinattieri, which was the art, uh, the guilds, the guilds, the yes, guilds the guild, related yes. to the wine selling, not the wine making, but the mm -hmm. wine selling, uh, was already among others, Arti Minori and other, um, other guilds, uh, probably the most important. Uh, during that time, it means that uh, the Medici family uh, protected and organized and recognized to these guilds uh, an important value for the current society. So uh, this specific passage shows a lot about the importance of the winemaking, the wine selling throughout the society of the Middle Age. Uh, just to give you some extra uh, notes, for example, the so-called Osteria, that took the name from the Latin Ostaria, uh, were very um, deeply established in town. Uh, most of the famous artists, such as Leonardo, Michelangelo, and so on, used to go to the Osteria and to have wine and to discuss around the wine, sometimes even to fight <laughs> about the discussion into right. the wine. So the wine was something that uh, uh, prevailed not just on the common use, not just on the um, uh, food side, but also in terms of uh, uh, attitude, in terms of uh, something that is important in the society to discuss about right. it. Uh, the Chianti itself, this is our stuff, started to appear with the word Chianti related to wine during the beginning of the Renaissance. Uh, at the very beginning, you have to know that the word Chianti was not often related to the red wine, but most of the time related to the white wine. The wine coming from the mountains of Chianti, Chianti Mountains, Monti del Chianti, which is, which is, it was and still is a geographical area in the heart of Tuscany. Uh, during the Medici dynasty, especially in the middle of this process, um, this turned into the red Chianti from the city of Florence and the wine itself from the region of Chianti tend to be more and more strong. Okay. So at the end of the Renaissance, actually, the red wine from Florence was identified like Vino Chianti. Hmm? So this Chianti, throughout this world, which is, for me, is like a magical word. I often say that it's like a Venus abracadabra. You pronounce <laughs> right. Chianti and you close your eyes and immediately you are in, an, in another dimension. Uh, full of wine, beautiful places, slopes, churches, everything related to Dolce Vita style, like mm -hmm. we say it in Italy. Uh, but the word itself um, has, um, has not um, a scientific explanation. So we don't know exactly what did it mean in the past, the word Chianti, but we know for sure that was related to that specific geographical area. Okay. After a couple of centuries, in, 19, uh, sorry, in 1716, another Medici um, family uh, member, in this case the Grand Duke Cosimo III, uh, wrote the very first document related to the wine production and to the wine protection in Tuscany and probably all over the world. The so-called Bando Medicio was a series of laws related to the wine production in Tuscany, first of all, mentioning and defining the limits of the most important appellation that he recognized. First of all, Chianti, of course, but also Pomino, 
which was part of Chianti Rufina, technically speaking, northeast of the city of Florence. Then we have um, um, Carmignano, which is a very interesting, it's still is a very interesting appellation in between the provinces of Florence and Prato. And then we have Valdarno di Sopra, which is uh, now recognized like a separated appellation, but it's basically a wine, a wine that has been produced for uh, centuries in the valley of Arno facing the south of uh, um, Florence and going towards to Arezzo city, so okay. uh, in, in south direction. So these four um, zones of production, uh, according to the, the thought of uh, Cosimo III de' Medici, they were the best places to find the best wines. So he started to define the limits of these zones and uh, I think probably that the most interesting and pioneer things that he, he, he has done, it was to create some organization in order to, uh, how to say, uh, to uh, protect this appellation themselves throughout, um, like wine police of the time, because yes, you yes. have to know that all these wines were counterfeited because they were very famous. So during the Renaissance, they already had uh, Chianti fake, uh, maybe some Nobile di Montepulciano fake, uh, Carmignano mm -hmm. fake. So Cosimo III had a very uh, interesting and very uh, amazing thought in order to organize this kind of uh, uh, protection um, for, this, uh, for these appellations. And that was another great step towards to the, um, the new era of Chianti. After a century, almost two centuries later, um, another distinct man, in this case, Bettino Ricasoli, Bettino Ricasoli uh, the so-called Byron Hiron, uh, from the Ricasoli family. Uh, it was called Byron Hiron because he had a lot of uh, uh, such a strong character. Okay. So, strong attitude. Right. He was very determined to different things. He was a great politician. Um, he has been the um, first, the prime minister of Italy also. So a lot of things, but most of all, uh, from our side, I think uh, that probably uh, Bettino Ricasoli was like the very first Chianti lover. So uh, I often say that Ricasoli probably was a bit obsessed about creating his proper new idea of the new Chianti. Because until that time, you know, that Chianti was mm, spread all over Tuscany, but every single family had his proper recipe. So there was not a clear, defined idea on how to produce Chianti. Chianti was not the wine that nowadays we have on the table and uh, was not the wine that at the beginning of the last century appeared on the tables all over the world. Yeah. It was something different. It was the like the... Um, um, the big brother of the Chianti that we know nowadays. Ricasoli had an intuition, um, amazing again, because he bet on a single variety or all over the others. Uh, I mean, the um, Sangiovese grape. Mm -hmm. At that time, Sangiovese grape was not so famous, was not the heart of Chianti, was one of the several grape varieties cultivated in this promiscuous vineyards. So you had uh, Colorino, Canaiolo, Trebbiano, Malvasia, Malvasia Nera, Sangiovese. So probably Sangiovese was like in a corner, a little bit shy. <laughs> and Ricasoli somehow uh, had this uh, amazing intuition and said, okay, to me, Sangiovese must be and can be the soul, the essence of the new Chianti, of my idea of the new Chianti. So he started to investigate a lot. He started to cultivate separately Sangiovese grape. And you know that this process takes years. You have to plant, yes. you have to select different clones, you have mm -hmm. to wait, you have to vinify the new wine and to check what does it mean to produce an under percent Sangiovese grape. Because basically the original Chianti was a recipe made of a Jewish of dozens of different clones and different grape varieties, including white grape varieties. So the idea of using just one single grape variety to create the bones of the new Chianti is something that it's, it's amazing. It is amazing, especially according to the times of Bettino Ricasoli.
Mm -hmm. So I started this slow process uh, and uh, in the halfway to the end of this process, he met another distinct man that was called uh, Professor Cesare Studiati from the University of Pisa. He was the very first um, one to investigate about the wine, analyzing the wine in a chemical way. So in the laboratory to understand what, hap what is happening really into the bunches, into the vineyard, not just having some uh, intuition, but technically speaking. And this friendship in between uh, Ricasoli and Studiati lasted at least, I think, 30 years. Okay. During this large, uh, long time, uh, they exchanged a lot of different letters. Uh, at the time, there was not WhatsApp, so imagine themselves <laughs> no sending, idea, no idea. Sending, <laughs> sending the uh, no emails, no WhatsApp, no phone, so no phone, sending yeah. letters. Uh, detailed letters explaining, uh, I don't, for example, because he had a strong uh, uh, fight with uh, what he called, used to call raschio in Italian, and especially in Tuscany, raschio, it means when you have this green harshness and sensation in the tongue, in the tongue and in the, in the palate and in the throat okay. due to the harshness of uh, that time Sangiovese. So he wrote a le uh, letters to Studiati telling that I don't know how to manage this harshness, this raschio that I want to keep out from my new Chianti. So slowly experimenting, replying during decades. Mm -hmm. At the very end of this process, um, we are in 1872, uh, in uh, one of the last letters to uh, Cesare Studiati, Bettino Ricasoli wrote what we considered after is that the new formula of the new version of Chianti wine. Okay. And he said that Sangiovese must be the soul of Chianti because give to the wine the structure, the character, the tannic structure. But uh, since it is quite rustic, it need to be helped uh, throughout especially two grape varieties. The first one it is Canaiolo, especially Canaiolo Nero, which is an indigenous uh, gentle gray variety that gives to the um, um, Sangiovese base um, um, a little bit more round palate, a little bit more floral, tends to be more uh, gentle to the blend. And to close this blend, to use uh, a small quantity of uh, white Malvasia, Malvasia Bianca, that tend to dilute the, the blend and tend to give some small sweetness to the to the wine so the original version of Chianti uh, the intimate formula of Bettino Ricasoli was meant to be a blend where Sangiovese was finally the structure the mm -hmm. the soul of yeah. the new Chianti after the death of Ricasoli of course a lot of people took his uh, heritage in terms of knowledge and uh, since now, Chianti and a lot of, a number of wines in Tuscany uh, started to be uh, Sangiovese-based wine. Just, I, I made an example during our masterclass, for example, if you consider that Brunello di Montalcino, which is one of the most recent appellation in Tuscany. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because a lot of people now is talking about Brunello di Montalcino, like it, it, it always been like Brunello di Montalcino, but it's not. Brunello di Montalcino was born like at the beginning of the previous century. So um, quite new like appellation. Mm -hmm. And the invention of Biondi Santi to make an 100% based wine throughout a long aging, of course, it was influenced by the work of Bettino Ricasoli. Because nobody at that time knew if it was not for Bettino Ricasoli the importance and the potential of the grape itself, Sangiovese. Right. So, at the beginning of the last century, Chianti uh, boomed. Uh, we had um, an incredible and amazing rise of the demand of the wine throughout uh, the migrants, especially in North America, South America. Mm -hmm. uh, this demand of nostalgic uh, food and wine helped a lot Chianti to be spread all over the world. And another very important fact is that uh, at the end of the 19th century, Phylloxera arrived to Europe. Arrived, arrived to Europe and arrived firstly to France, Spain, Portugal. Uh, curiously, our competitors at that time. <laughs> right. It arrived a little bit slowlier 
to Tuscany and Italy. So this gap of 15 years, 20 years helped a lot because our competitors were down and Chianti were rising, was rising. So the demand, according to the production, the increasing production, helped a lot to boom the Chianti all over the world. So the myth of the fiasco battle, the, the, the straw uh, battle fiasco all over the world, uh, was born during the first decades of the, the last century. Uh, of course, after this, Philoxera arrived to, mm-hmm. to, to Italy and to Chianti. We went through a deep crisis until the, the 60s, more or less. After the Second World War, Chianti started to, um, to rehab a little bit itself, and, uh, but very slowly. Mm-hmm. We arrived until the 70s, more or less, Uh, with the concept of uh, high quantity of Chianti, daily wine, uh, famous, but the quality was not that high. Mm -hmm. During the 80s, uh, thanks to the the happening of the super task and rise, uh, a lot of producers producers changed their mentality into quality wines. So finally, the 90s has been the, the first decade into the quality concept and now we can join wine that are definitely into an average uh, of um, high quality standards. Yeah. Nowadays, it's, um, it's almost impossible to, to find uh, bad quality wines, especially in Chianti. Uh, Chianti is probably one of the best sellers, not just because of the quality and, the, and to be an icon, in the winemaking, but also because it's a very affordable in terms of prices. It's very, um, um, it's friendly in yeah. every single sense. Absolutely. And you know. its attitude to have this brilliant acidity, uh, medium body, mm-hmm. never too intense. It is very versatile and dynamic on the table. You would say gastronomic wine. Yeah, yeah, Food certainly. Friends. So uh, during the tasting, not, not during the masterclass, so the wines were fantastic. But during the walk around tasting, I got to taste this just Chianti, not uh, not any of these little sub zones. I mean, they were they were there too, but like just a normal like everyday Chianti, all the way up to like some Brunellos and Vincentos, um, some really cool stuff. And then I was I was I was telling Luca on, on the way over here, they're also doing some really interesting things with some some great varieties in, in Tuscany, but just the value there with, with Chianti as just a everyday drinking wine that you don't have to spend a lot of money on, but the quality is there. Um, it's fantastic. You know, it's, I, I occasionally will, will get, I'll I'll say, you know what, let's go and buy this Chianti for like $10. I'm like, okay. And every time I'm like, this is fantastic. Yeah. Like it's $10 wine and there's not, not many places out there that you can do that as as far as, especially in Europe, there's a couple places you can still get like $10 wines that are fantastic. Um, but you usually have to go elsewhere to really find that type of value uh, and quality. So yeah, yeah I was, yeah, um, yeah the, the walk around tasting was, was fantastic. I think that the quality, uh, when you want to test uh, a country, a wine country, um, throughout the quality, this is the, the most important thing. I mean, to produce great wine, uh, great pricey wine, I don't want to say that it's easy, but it's much easier to produce, to produce great wine with affordable price. It's the challenge. So if you can do so, it means that the average of the quality of your country is the highest possible. And Chianti, I think that uh, is representing a lot this concept because for us in Italy, especially uh, wine itself is like food. So to drink wine is not just to drink a liquid or to drink a beverage. It's, it's part of the food culture. Mm-hmm. So wine uh, doesn't have to be uh, that much expensive because it has to be part of your diet, including. Yeah. So this concept is uh, pretty well um, mirrored in Chianti, especially in this modern Chianti. Mm-hmm. You have something affordable. Uh, the quality is, is very affordable and uh, the diversity itself is another right. uh, point of trend of the modern Chianti. So all this subregion, all these shades doesn't have to scare you, has to intrigue you. 
Right. Mm, I often say we have seven sub-region, seven days of the week. You have <laughs> every day nice. a different excuse to try a different Chianti. Don't be scared about trying Chianti, for example, with fish or seafood because the acidity of Chianti and the acidity mm -hmm. of Sangiovese is the key to understand Sangiovese-based wine. Absolutely. This brilliant acidity is going to clean your palate. It's going to make you salivate in. They are not that much full-bodied wine, so they are quite elegant, red fruits, sometimes dark fruits, mm -hmm. but still in an elegant attitude. So right. this makes, I think... Chianti grapes, and this make Chianti nowadays like uh, um, old style wine from one end, but at the same time, very modern wine. Okay, yeah. yeah. So um, when we did the tasting, so we've we're talking about there's seven different regions. Um, six of them were like uh, found in like 1932. Is that the, yep. the first six, 1932? The last one, and that was uh, Montes Yes, Montes Pertoli, um, 1997. See, I listened, um, <laughs> um, which I, I, which that one was great. And I actually got, I tried it again during the, during the walk around. Um, so we, we, we try these and it was cool because you had a plan on how to organize these. It wasn't just like a East, West, North, South. I mean, you started with more of like, um, kind of body and complexity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this, you know, even, so the very first one with the, uh, Pisane, I mean, that was awesome. It was like a really great, um, easy to drink wine, but quality was there. You know, the city yeah. was there, the freshness, yeah. which we talked about freshness a lot during that master class. Yeah. Um, and then going along the, uh, going all, all the way over to the Rufina, which, so um, it's funny because there was very, very specific. We talked about Rufina, not Rufina, because it's the more about people, yeah. well, people think about Rufino, which is a large producer, actually yeah. negotiant and nothing wrong with them. I've, I've had plenty of their stuff, but it was funny. It was like, um, I don't know if it was you or Jeremy was talking about, it was like near the top and I'm sitting there going, yes, yeah, the roof, the Rufina, <laughs> Rufina, Rufina, roof. So it's the roof of Chianti. So that's how I'm going to remember yeah, that. It is. I don't know. I, I, I almost wanted to go, it's the roof, right? But no, nah. <laughs> anyway, um, so these were some really cool things. I, I know we're getting it kind of long on time here. So um, was is there something? Uh, so we talked about how um, a couple of highlights was that uh, uh, Pisane is like almost literally on the Tyrrhenian Sea. So hmm. what what makes Quite that good. kind of what makes that kind of different than say maybe there's some more inland things? Yeah, uh, to understand this diversity, we first have to remember that um, Sangiovese grape. It's a quite sensitive grape and reflects a lot the place where you are cultivating more than other grape varieties. Right. If you are doing an experiment, for example, to plant Sangiovese and in the next vineyard to plant Merlot, you will obtain great results in Tuscany. There is no place in Tuscany where you cannot have great wines. Actually, we are very lucky mm -hmm. to have this kind of soils and, and climate conditions. Uh, but Sangiovese, it is very detailed. Mm -hmm. It is like, sometimes I use this kind of comparison, I don't know if it's proper, but it is like the te technology that you have in the screens. You have HD, micro okay. LED, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. Sangiovese is like super HD details of the soils. So it shows a lot the identity of the soil and is very sensitive. It's not easy to manage Sangiovese, even if it's very and pretty widely cultivated in the center of uh, Italy, especially in Tuscany, of course. Most of the wine appellation uh, in Tuscany are Sangiovese-based wine. Okay. Chianti, Chianti Classico, Novi Monte Pulciano, Morino di Scansano, Brunelli Montalcino, Carmignano, and so on. Uh, but it's very um, detailed and very sensitive, especially because the, the, the bunches itself and the plant itself, in the case of the bunches, the grains has a very thin skin. Okay. So they need to have light, they need to have a longer maturation, longer, a longer ripening, uh, and they reflect a lot, more than others. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, this attitude of Sangiovese shows a lot the heterogeneous soils of Chianti. In Colline Pisane, uh, you have a couple of factors that help a lot Chianti to uh, ripe in a more balanced way. Uh, for example, the, the mild temperature 
and uh, not very high in altitude because normally we have slopes 150, 200, sometimes 250, but not that much. There are no mountains surrounding Chianti Colline Pisane. Okay. So you have a lot of constant breezes, delicate breezes coming from the seaside. So this uh, even uh, saltiness that you can feel in some Chianti Colline mm-hmm. Pisane is probably due to this uh, to be close to the to the seaside. And ripening, as I mentioned, is normally more balanced and a little bit earlier than the interior part of Chianti. Yeah, and sandy that, yeah, soils I, I got that. Yeah, yeah, more, like than, uh, yeah. more than clay. Mm-hmm. Uh, it means that you have normally some more um, in in the pa- on the palate. You can feel um, more richer fruits, some more round palate fruits, uh, good acidity, but also good sweetness. Of the right. grapes. This is normally related to the sandy soil from Chianti Colline Pisane. Sometimes you also have some overripe, small ends. You have these balsamic notes on the mm-hmm. nose, so are quite exuberant on the nose and aromas. And they have this, um, I, I like to call it like Mediterranean touch. Right. So it's, la, it's a kind of Chianti that shows a lot the solar uh, attitude of the wine coming from the coast. Okay. Yeah, and then as we moved in, uh, it was somewhat of a moving in more inland, um, but each area had some difference with soils, different with elevation. We definitely had a lot of ones that were uh, higher elevation besides uh, uh, Rufina uh, being very high elevation. You also had some other areas that were along the uh, Apennine Mountains. Uh, so that was what the... Um, uh, not. You had that was Mon- Mon- Montalbano, Montalbano, Montalbano yeah, Montalbano, uh, Montesperoli, um, and all these, and then Arezzo, uh, Coleretini, yes, of yeah, course, and, Arezzo, and um, yeah, Art- Artini near Arezzo. Um, so how does that elevation really affect what we're going to get from the grape? Yeah, that's a good question, especially affect the wine uh, before being wine in the in the vineyards uh, on the summertime during the horizon time. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you need um, a change of the climate condition in between nine and day, especially in Chianti Rufina, Coleretini, Montalbano, since you are pretty close to the mountain, not just because of the altitude itself, but to be close to the mountains as helps a lot, uh, because these uh, night breezes helps to calm down the temperature during the day mm-hmm. and to refresh the graves themselves. So what happened is normally the Sangiovese um grown on the mountains normally has a little bit more uh, delicate aromas uh, higher in acidity normally a little bit more austere body and uh, they tend to be uh, wine that you have to wait for a longer time in order to age them because of this natural structure okay. especially in Chianti Rufina and especially in Chianti in a good part of Chianti Colli Retini where you have some rustic uh, substances that you have to uh, wait a little bit more to obtain a finer result but uh, what happened with the Sangiovese is normally is this that uh, when you have this uh, change of temperature during the summertime helps a lot to have uh, delicate and very fine aromas, violet hints, uh, mm-hmm. red fruits. Uh, in Rufina, you can have a lot of uh, nice example of this attitude of Sangiovese. Okay. Um, and one of the things about this tasting, which um, I don't think I've ever had a tasting just like this, is that you focused on these areas, but you didn't tell us the producers until the end so what was the purpose of that yeah yeah it's a it's a choice of the our association has been a choice for for years um because basically we have a number of uh, producers involved in the canty wine production to be more precise we have something like 3600 companies Mm -hmm. involved in the production of canty and most of them are associated wineries to our association, to consortia. Uh, to have this number of wineries associated, it means to have like 3,000 sons. Yeah, right. So <laughs> how can we be polite promoting a brand, showing the brand and every detail related to the brand uh, during a tasting without falling in some personal promotion? Mm-hmm. 
So the aim of the association is to promote the appellation, Chianti appellation, to help the producer um, throughout the, 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 the race, and, um, but not to uh, promote one or another winery. So we decided for the very uh, first time to skip this information uh, during the introduction of the, this master classes a few years ago. And we found it uh, a good choice. And um, this is the political institutional mm -hmm. yeah. uh, decision, decision. The other thing that I think is more interesting for the, um, the attendees is that um, when you are performing and experiencing a blind tasting, it is way much better than the normal ones because you are not influenced about the brand, about the, the winery itself. Absolutely. Because if you are in presence of a great name, probably you will never say, okay, I don't like this wine because maybe it's a very important name and you, you feel a little bit shy to tell this. So, and uh, so you, have, um, you are free to analyze, to listen to the wine, to judge the wine if you want, or to comment the wine without knowing the producer. Yeah. And let me say, and it's a little bit also, also intriguing, this game of uh, uh, walking through how these different subregions without knowing who is who behind the bottle. Until the end, of course. At the very end of the seminar, we reveal the bottles so everyone can have a look and maybe most of the time can discover something that they didn't know. And at the very end, people normally say, okay, I didn't expect that uh, even this small winery that I didn't know could have this great quality. This wine is amazing. So thank you, thank you for, uh, for showing us the beauty of the wine itself without being uh, influenced about brand and marketing itself. Yeah. Hey, my light went off. It's not supposed to go off by now. <laughs> um, we still have plenty of light. Anyway, um, so that's probably a little hint for, I, I, I don't know what time you have to leave. I just want to make sure I'm being cognizant yeah, of your, we, of we your are time. Yeah, we're moving to Los Angeles. Because I'm today. spending the night, and he, he's he's heading out to L.A. later today. I'm, I'm spending the night, so I have all day long. Um, but, yeah, so I want to mention that with, with the wines, so I took the pictures of everything, which I probably already shown you the pictures of all the wines we did. And um, and I, I would say I'm really not familiar with those producers, especially and even the walk around. This was an amazing experience because I got to experience a lot of producers I've never heard of or I'm not or maybe not as familiar with. And, you know, there's the fact that the quality is is there across the board. You don't have to be the big names. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's very important. Like you yeah. said, uh, with a blind tasting, you're not influenced. Now, I'm a wine critic. I'm not influenced by that at all. Wink, wink. Um, I mean, Never in, judge a yeah. book from its cover. With, with in in my criticism side of things, yes, I know who I'm. I know who I'm um, tasting. I'm um, evaluating. I probably did a lot of research on who it was. Maybe if, even if it was somebody I was not familiar with, I find out that they might be somewhat of, have an importance or I, I, you know, iconic status. But in in my world, when I do this, I try to be as critical as possible. And especially if they are a big name, not a, now they have to live up to the reputation. Yeah. If someone doesn't have like this, like very, very high reputation type of thing, like iconic status, then they, there's no pressure. Yeah. And so, yes, yeah, so that where maybe you get the you're impressed, like, oh, wow, this is way more than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. But yes, if it's somebody that is has a reputation of having expensive wines and yeah. top quality, then, yes, you can be very critical and be like, well, does it live up to that quality? Is it worth that price? Yeah. So having it blind, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm judging it on the wine and what it's for. Yeah. And then you look at it later on. Um, yeah. And so I think that was a really cool touch to do that. You know, yes, two weeks ago, I mean, which for you guys is last week, two weeks ago, you know, we knew every single wine. We knew it, was, it wasn't the same vintage. It was all vintages from 17 to 04. Um, they're all in, they're all his, uh, classic Amarone producers. But at the same time, it's like we kind of had an expectation and they all met the expectations. Some of them exceeded it. But in this case, it was like, let's just talk about the region, 
not focus on the producers necessarily. And then we can talk about the producers later because I think what, like you were trying to show is there's a quality going on here, especially with these subregions that maybe some of us really, even in the industry, don't really pay attention to. Yeah. We just think of it as Chianti, yeah. not the seven subregions. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I, if, if I had this on my exam uh, a month ago, which by the way, since the last video you saw, I passed my theory. So I'm going to be taking the second two portions in July in, in uh, Phoenix. Uh, and Jeremy called me out. And it, I like Jeremy called me out, but Jeremy was trying to already make me a master sommelier. <laughs> <laughs> Advanced Jeremy. Um, but um, if, if I had been asked something about these, I, I probably would have been like, I don't know. Um, I might have gotten something right. But now that I've gone through this, at least there's familiarity with it you know and I, that's again like i mentioned in last week's video i do these things to study yeah i was actually talking with a, a gentleman named jaime who is with kroger uh he's an advanced sommelier here in houston and i told him like i go to these things because you know what? it's a secret way to study <laughs> because that's how i look at it you know i don't have to worry about theory right now in in, a, in a two months uh i might have an italian um service environment restaurant that i have to be in nice. and i might have to say something about one of these regions i might have to see a list and be like oh i'm familiar with these different regions uh sub regions of chianti and I, maybe i can use that in my pairing of things so this always ties into theory when we talk about our tasting or our our service component with an exam it all ties into theory so just because i passed that one little section doesn't mean i can just let up on the gas mm -hmm though there are certain parts of the world I have to pay more attention to than others. Um, anyway, uh, look, at it. this has been a fantastic interview. I felt like I had, a, I got a, I got a second masterclass, uh, personalized. Um, this is one of the perks of doing what I do. Uh, I know you probably got to get going as I see everybody like packing up and getting their yeah, the luggage. In fact, while we were doing this, yeah. some people came in and grabbed their luggage. They were really quiet. I appreciate that. Um, is there anything else you want to kind of wrap up with or talk about that we maybe oh, need to say? Well, just, just, just remember to the uh, to people that uh, Chianti is still there. Chianti is, is still alive mm -hmm. uh, because as our president mentioned at the beginning of the seminar, uh, Chianti is probably the most renowned um, red wine appellation, Italian, mm -hmm. uh, red Italian wine appellation in the world. But when it comes to the glasses, into the glasses, probably this is the most unknown because all the people believe that they know something about Chianti until they taste the wine and they say, okay, well, what is this about? Montesperto, Montesperto. Yeah, right, yeah. I didn't know that Montespertoli was a subregion of Chianti, for example. So there is a lot, still a lot to, to do, uh, to promote and to um, put in evidence what, are the, what is the beauty, the real beauty of, uh, of the modern Chianti. And again, this diversity, this heterogeneous um, kaleidoscope of uh, Sangiovese shades and styles, uh, I think it's, um, it's um, very intriguing and, uh, and very um, modern at the same time. And um, so my aim, my, uh, how to say, uh, my pray for the people is to uh, drink more Chianti, discover more Chianti, uh, don't be um, fixed on some uh, um, classic stereotypes about Chianti. Uh, Chianti, it is not the fiasco from the Hades. It right. is not the wine with the bad, aggressive, green acidity. It is a modern wine. It is pleasant, very fresh, lively. And most of all, is probably the best companion that you can have with food. So if you love food, you must love Chianti at some point. And, uh, and that's it. I think that um, um, this attitude of Chianti to be easygoing uh, is, is the starting point. Yes. So it's, it's the, the thing that is connecting people without having this kind of... Uh, uh, sometimes some wine regions, some wines put you in a, in a quite shy um, position because they yeah. are very famous brand, very expensive. So you barely 
uh, want to, to buy them because you are scared about them, because you don't know, maybe I'm investing my money in a good way or bad way. So when you buy a bottle of Chianti, please uh, try to feel yourself, yourself like, uh, um, like an Italian. So is it going? Buy it. Pair it. Experience it. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's about now. It's not about uh, um, too many marketing aspects, too many technical aspects. Because I often say that um, um, the winemaking and the viticulture itself is like poetry. Okay? Uh, but if you try to explain uh, a poem word per word, every single sentence, in, sentence uh, you are killing okay. the poetry itself. So, investigate about wine means, I think, most of the time to fell, to fall in love with the wine. Mm -hmm. And after this, to get some extra information, okay, is, is more than welcome to do this. But don't kill the poetry in winemaking. And Chianti, I think that is mirroring a lot this... Um, this attitude, this very yeah. um, um, easygoing attitude, very welcoming attitude, uh, some Italian warmth. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. my aim is to push people into this attitude before push them inside the, the wine itself. I'll bring it back to my side because sommeliers love to get love, love what tech sheets they want all yeah. the numbers, and that's fine and all. And I geek out on this stuff too. But at the end of the day. Enjoy it. Yeah. Enjoy the wine. Don't worry about the details of how, what the percentage of this, that, and what, what's the grams per liter of something or yeah. the pH. And they're all wonderful things to understand, but do that later. Enjoy yeah. the wine. And then if you want to geek out on it, go ahead and geek out on it. And my viewers know I geek out on wine all the time. <laughs> I love tech sheets. I love knowing the numbers. But at the end of the day, does the wine taste good? Yeah. And that's really all that matters. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and did, did you pay a good price for it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the most important thing, the producer is making wine to, to, to please people, yeah. to drink the wine. That's it. Mm -hmm. Very easy. Yeah. Very easy, but it's not obvious. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you again. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure to come here, sit down with you. Again, have like a second master class. <laughs> uh, it will reinforce everything. Um, so, folks, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, as always, uh, just make sure you click like and subscribe. Tell all your friends about the best wine show anywhere, and we will see you next time. <laughs>